Hello and welcome to Calm Versations with the Voice of Reason. I'm your host, Benjamin Boyce, and today's special guest is Julie Bendel, who is an English, or that is British, radical feminist writer and co-founder of the law reform group Justice for Women. In this conversation, we talk about her radical feminism, her arc of getting involved in feminism, and we also tackle the question, what does it mean to liberate women from patriarchy. Julie Bendel is very wise and very knowledgeable and also very active and has been involved in feminism since the late 70s. So she has a particularly wide angled lens at the developments of, you know, the positive developments of feminism and the current situation that feminism finds itself in butting up against gender ideology. Very happy to have spoken with her and I got a lot out of this. So without further ado, here is Julie Bindel. Would you mind showcasing your history a bit? Like where, when you started uh, being the powerhouse that you have come to be? What kicked off your journey? I think what started me on a journey to feminism was growing up in a very traditional working class household in the northeast of England, which is... You know, it was pretty tough. Uh, we lived in social housing, went to a really bad school. And I grew up in an extremely loving family, um, but with two brothers, one older, one younger, and a patriarchal father who worked uh, in a steel mill. So it's a very heavy, masculine job. And the kind of gender roles were very, very stark, although my mom was always an unconscious feminist. I started looking a little bit beyond what was set out for me, my fate, if I stayed there, so working in a factory or a store, marrying a local boy, having three kids in succession, and not having any expectations of higher education or traveling the world, that kind of thing. But at the same time, I realized that I was attracted to Um, a school friend who I had a major crush on. I was less interested in boys. I had the fortune to come across a copy of a publication called Gay Times, which back in the 1970s was pretty much the only publication um, on gay issues. And it covered some serious topics, but also had gave an opportunity to those of us that were isolated, those of us thinking we were lesbian or gay, to make contact with others, not for sex or dating, but for actual friendship um, Mm. and forming community. So I think that those things came together in that my quest for a different life as a girl emerging into womanhood was very much enmeshed with the realization that I wanted to be a lesbian and not feel ashamed of that and be able to live as an out lesbian without getting my head kicked in um, and to meet other women. So that really was the beginning. Mm -hmm. And so what you're inheriting then is a tradition of gay community, gay lesbian community, and also a feminist tradition. And the feminist tradition in Britain, so far as I know, is different. It's got a different flavor. It's got a different kind of history than American feminism. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's not thoroughly known, at least to somebody of my level of ignorance. Um, So what what are the, the roots of those communities and that kind of tradition and then the activism too? That's a really good point about the different types of feminism and a really good question about about how they differ because we in the women's liberation movement in the UK, which, you know, I'm talking about the second wave, which began in the late 1960s and I joined at the very, very end of the 70s when I was still a teenager, I was 17, focused on and still in its authentic form focuses on women at the very bottom of the pile, not women at the glass ceiling, women in the basement. So in other words, we really were not as actual authentic feminists as opposed to the kind of liberal 
appeasing type. We really weren't interested in the glass ceiling, in whether or not women could make a million pound salary like their male counterparts in investment banking. We were concerned about the fact that women were, well, our common cause um, is the male, uh, the threat and reality of male violence, of patriarchy, of how that constrains our lives, lives in how patriarchy and male violence stops us from living as full citizens. And that's why it was so wrapped up with a critique of how heterosexuality further constrained women. Now, that wasn't to say that we believed that all heterosexual relationships were bad, that all women should be lesbians. We didn't believe that, and we don't believe that it is an either a natural or an unnatural state to be either lesbian or heterosexual. What we saw was for women under patriarchy being married to men and having children with those men in traditional relationships meant that women's lives were seriously curtailed, but also women were far less likely to be believed if they suffered abuse at the hands of their husband. So our feminism, unlike the our American uh, counterparts, was always about solidarity between women, finding the common cause whilst not dismissing the huge gulfs between us. The solidarity bit was about how we needed to combat male violence and that we thought as a part of that, that women should be able to live as lesbians, as heterosexual, as celibate, as non-monogamous, however, but that men shouldn't dictate that and men shouldn't be at the centre of our lives dictating that. The American feminists, from what from my point of view, were focused on what made their working life better, so therefore maternity leave, maternity benefits, childcare, better pay. All of those things are relevant to women across the world, of course. But American feminists had very little class analysis and seemed to do a top-down type of politics. Hmm. And when we think of England, again, it's a traditional thing. I've watched Downton Abbey. So there is a class, there's actually a literal class consciousness that you guys are very close to. It's not that far away. You still have a monarchy and vestiges of aristocracy. Or aristocracy. And then the working class material conditions really are very evident and marked by class markers and in, you inherit where you are. Do you focus or have you focused on the material conditions of what you're describing with regards to the freedom of mobility and choice in women in the lower classes and how the relationship between men and women changes when material conditions change? Absolutely, we have. Although the difference between the feminism I'm involved in and what's known as socialist feminism is that my type of feminism focuses on women as a sex class. So that theory was developed, um, I suppose, to run parallel with the Marxist theory of the proletariat, the working classes. In other words, there is a master. This isn't a natural state of things. It's how power has corrupted, how power develops and how there is a subservient class of people underneath you, and that subservient class of people can rise up um, and be liberated, as opposed to then become the classes, be liberated so there's no more oppression. With women as a sex class, what we see is patriarchy is at the centre of our world in terms of what constrains us, but that for poorer women, for women of colour, for disabled women, the mothers in working class uh, contexts, their oppression is amplified. Um, the tentacles of the additional oppressions make the conditions under patriarchy much worse, far more stark, much more difficult to disengage from. So a wealthy woman suffering domestic violence has some choices that poor women do not. 
but she's still suffering that violence and the material reality of being abused under patriarchy means she's still as scared of not being believed by police as is her working class counterpart. So we don't see, if, if you were to take, for example, a white working class woman, we would see the key variable as her sex, as how the world treats her as a woman. But socialist feminists would see her working class status as what determines her place in the world. We see sex, biological sex, as, as much more, um, I suppose, significant than do socialist feminists or, or liberal feminists. Mm -hmm. And what are kind of the basic accomplishments of second wave feminism, if we may use that term? Yeah, has there I mean, been developments in, in your work and has the landscape changed since you were, you've were you been involved in it? Yeah, I, I, I first encountered feminism at the very end of 1979. The movement was still extremely vibrant um, in, in, in North America, uh, across um, many countries in Europe, uh, in Western Europe. And there's been huge changes in terms of legislation around male violence, rape, sexual assault, domestic abuse, domestic violence, femicide, um, child custody, for example, lesbians used to automatically lose custody of their children hmm. when I first joined the women's movement. If um, their husband, the father of the children, told the court that she was a lesbian, they would often give children back to violent, abusive fathers, then leave those children with a lesbian with or without a lesbian partner. Hmm. And we've literally changed laws, changed hearts and minds when it comes to the one thing that unites women everywhere in the world, which is the threat and reality of male violence. So that's been massive. We've been less focused on issues such as um, equal pay, maternity benefits, parental leave, women's health, all things that are crucial to the lives of women but that affect different women at different times and some not at all so for example i've chosen not to have children um so issues to do with maternity leave and childcare do not affect me personally in the slightest but there isn't one woman in the world for whom male violence isn't an issue and i don't mean that every woman in the world is being constantly raped and abused I mean, that our lives are shaped by keeping ourselves safe or being blamed for what happens to us from sexual assault and being flashed at in the street through to the more, more serious end of that. But I think the changes are massive because now the vast majority of governments that sign up to international treaties and, and expect to be at the table at high level UN meetings um, on social issues really have to recognise within their legislation and policy um, that it's not all right to rape and beat a woman, even if she's your wife. So that's what's changed. And also, of course, if you look at, you know, married women's rights, that marriage used to be that that was it. You were official chattel. You were owned. Your children were owned. Your property, if you had any inheritance, became the property of the man. If you were a poorer woman with no means of your own, uh, you would get nothing if he decided to divorce you, including your children. And mm. that that has been massive. Those legislative changes through the um, through equality law and sex based rights, including women only facilities such as refuges um, and uh, hospital wings and you know all, all, all manner of kind of domestic violence services have come as a result of feminists in this wave, setting them up from scratch, often with no funding. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if we should fast forward at this point, but with the introduction of the concept of gender, what is that doing in your mind, from your position, to the gains made on the basis of sex? The idea that gender as 
an individual identity or an inner feeling or an expression should somehow trump sex is outrageous. Now, let me just caveat that. Feminists, real ones, do not believe that biology is destiny. We don't believe that there are huge, inescapable differences between men and women for the simple reason that we have different sex organs and chromosomes. We recognize, of course, um, I mean, the key issue of reproduction. Um, we recognize that in, in, in many ways, not all physical strength is an issue. Menopause is a big thing. Menstruation is a big thing, um, which can have um, uh, an undue, you know, can have a big influence on yes. women's lives at different times. However, we don't think that there are vast differences between men and women. We think that many of those differences are perceived differences. They're social constructions. Uh, they've been built up through sex stereotypes. Therefore, gender expression is something that is constructed. And when we fought for sex-based rights, when we fought for women-only spaces, we didn't do that because we think we should travel in our own carriages on the train because ladies should be separated from men. We do not believe in sex segregation. We think that's regressive. We think it's Victorian. We see it under religious fundamentalism. We don't like it. What we do insist upon, however, is that we are kept safe from predatory males. And again, this isn't to say all men walk around thinking I'll rape that woman I'll expose my genitals to her in a changing room is because we know that enough men do for women to be cautious of it. And we also know that if this happened to us, even in public places, often we're disbelieved and it's very unlikely that this man, the predator, will be arrested, charged and convicted of these crimes. So therefore it goes on and on. So we fought for sex based rights. We fought for women only services. And now they're under threat because, of course, a man who says he feels on a Tuesday like a woman because he's got a lady brain or because he thinks that it's about an inner feeling can invade those spaces. And that means even if he's not a sexual predator, that women no longer feel safe. And we fought for those reasons in order that we do feel safe until we see an end to male violence. And then why would I care? going into a changing room in a department store and seeing a man try on a pair of trousers with a bit of gristle hanging between his legs. I, I'm not going to be worried about that. The only concern I would have is if he intends to sexually assault. So it's not the actual physical differences between men and women that women need protecting from. Hmm. It's what he might choose to do with the power he has as a man uh, encountering a woman who can't escape him. It's as simple as that. Gender identity is a load of fucking nonsense. Gender identity is something that feminists have fought against. We don't want the imposition of gender upon us. That means that we're supposed to act in certain ways that disadvantage us. We want to be people, to be human beings, and we'd like to see that for men too. We don't want men to be in the straitjacket of masculinity, for example. Again, a social construction. Hmm. And where... When was the first time you saw this change, uh, and did, and where did you see it coming from, and how do you see it within uh, various strains or shaping feminism? Well, for me, you know, I've always, right since the early days, um, so four decades ago, been campaigning to end sexual violence, and that's what a lot of my writing is about, that's what my research has been about, that's what my campaigning's been about, is what gets me out of bed in the morning. And in 2003, I hadn't been in journalism very long. I'd left academic research, started doing full-time reporting, and became really interested in the idea that men, that there was this, there was this chain store called Transformations in London and in other cities in the UK, where men could go along and dress in traditional female clothing. And they could be dressed by a woman. These The women that worked in the store would do their makeup. They'd fit their feet into high heels. <clears throat> um, they would put on rubber um, breasts. They would even have rubber vaginas in which they could 
angle their penis so that they could sit down and urinate. They could take pills to bring on feelings of um, of uh, postmenstrual, uh, sorry, premenstrual uh, tension. All of the things that women don't want, right? So <clears throat> I got really interested in this store. Went along to do some interviews with the men, asking them why they wished to cross dress, um, what it was that gave them a kick out of wearing the type of clothes, Benjamin, that I have fought all of my life, never to have to fucking wear, or for the right for any girl to say, I don't want to put that frilly monstrosity on. And there were bridal outfits in this store. These men were like spending all day there. Clearly, uh, there were autogonophiliacs, but you know, it was also a way I was told in the store that men could release their tension. That they came in business suits from very high power jobs and they put on these female clothes and all of a sudden the tension dropped away. Isn't it interesting the way that women actually get stressed by having to adopt this feminine role and be kind of treated as subservient by men? But hey, um, and from that investigation, which I was doing for the Sunday Telegraph magazine, I decided to meet some people identified as transsexual to find out what they thought of these cross-dressers. And I met, um, the language then was transsexual, transsexual woman, Claudia, who had, as a young gay man, been mercilessly bullied and then entered a gay relationship with a man who really hated being gay and told Claudia, if you don't get a sex change, I'll leave you. And Claudia was diagnosed very quickly by a shark psychiatrist who's since been struck off um, and sent for surgery, sent for hormones. And Claudia had lived as a woman all the years after that. She transitioned in the 80s. I interviewed her in 2003. And I met Claudia expecting her to tell me that for some men, we just feel that we're women, we're trapped in the wrong body, and we change. And actually, what Claudia told me was, well, first of all, she said to me, do you know what the difference is between a transvestite, transvestites being the men in the transformation store dressing up? So she said, what's the difference between a transvestite and a transsexual? She said, it's usually about two years. So in other words, they go on to want to live permanently as women. And she then told me that she'd regretted her sex change all her life, but that she couldn't change back. She'd had full surgery, full hormones, and that she thought it was a fallacy. She thought it was just ridiculous, the idea that you can't just live in your own skin happily. So anyway, I published this article. It was just before articles started being put online from magazines, from newspaper supplements, and nobody noticed it. But they did notice my article a few months later in January 2004 in The Guardian, in which I wrote about Vancouver rape relief that had just been put through a decade of horrible litigation by a trans woman who wanted to become a rape counsellor. And this was a male-bodied trans woman who then took Vancouver rape relief to court when they said, no, it's not appropriate. They said it very kindly, very gently. And this trans person tried to close that centre down. So I wrote a column in The Guardian, and it was just as the trans rights movement was galvanising on list serves, which was before social media. So it was more kind of communities online where people could chat to each other. And my article caused a lot of fascination. I was talking about sex stereotypes. I said rather cheekily, but hey, that's the kind of writer I am. Why do trans women dress as extremely feminine as possible when we try to reject it? Those, those horrible clothes. And why do trans men get tattooed up, the beards, the muscles? They're so extreme. You know, imagine a world inhabited just by transsexuals it would look like the set of greece hmm. and you know that was it they were on me they were on me and they've never left 17 years ago 
you know, I have been a target of, you know, mobs of people that follow me all over the world screaming about how transphobic I am. Hmm. And it was at that time that the trans movement rose up and galvanized. And that's when I saw in following this stuff, because I'd become dragged into the war, um, that the gender stuff was going crazy. Sex was being dismissed as immaterial, as irrelevant. And what mattered more, said the trans activists, and of course the liberals listened to them because they were too frightened not to. What mattered more, they said, was gender identity, gender expression and an inner feeling that a person has. And I had no idea what they meant when they said, I've always felt like a woman because I have never known what it feels like to be a woman. I just know I am one. I couldn't tell you what it feels like to be a woman. In your, especially in your pubescent years, did you ever experience uh, some form of dysmorphia or dislike of being a woman? Uh, what was your struggle like with accepting being a woman? Oh, yeah, I hated my girlhood. I hated my girlhood once I, once I reached puberty because then the sexual harassment begins. Your breasts grow and men comment in it, on it. As girls, you're very vulnerable, very shy, very teasable. You know, I would have boys telling me that I must be a lesbian because I wasn't interested in them and they would follow me around commenting on my clothing. School uniforms were horrible for girls. We had to wear skirts. And I think this is how most girls feel. But some of them just cover it very well and then buy into the heterosexual norm and then get rewarded for being kind of a real woman looking like a pretty girl. And I was never into that. Um, and so I suppose if, you know, calling it, I do believe gender dysphoria is real. I think most girls experience it and, and an awful lot of boys. I wanted to be a boy because that would have made me normal. So I wanted to be a boy also because that would have meant freedom. I wouldn't have to wear these stupid clothes. I could do what my brothers did. I could go and climb trees and play around and get muddy and wear jeans and not be told to look ladylike and to cross my legs in a certain way and to avoid leering men um, in shopping malls or whatever. And I would have been happier because my attraction to girls wouldn't have been seen as freaky and unnatural. And that wasn't because I was really a boy, a trans man or whatever. It was because I was a lesbian and a girl growing up under patriarchy, acutely aware of how my gender, in terms of the sex stereotypes imposed on me, held me back and also made me a target. You mentioned the liberals being scared, uh, listening to radicals and kind of going along. You said that they possibly could be scared with them. Is there a way, it seems like we were almost at a point where we could see each other as human beings and kind of let that gender stuff come and go and you can accept it or not accept it. And then it started to be enforced as and concretized in this way where where now there's 84 different genders and you have to believe in all these things it doesn't really make sense but it's there it seems like we we missed the target in a way where yeah. we could have what do you think about that and how do we how do we uh, get to, to the right balance oh absolutely because obviously <clears throat> it's great for young people to say look i'm gender fluid I refuse to be labelled as, as male or female because what they're doing is they're questioning the binary. They're questioning sex stereotypes, but they wouldn't put it like that because they've been taught by Judith fucking Butler. So they put it in a way that is, it's all performance, as if girls in menstrual huts uh, um, in Nepal perform their girlhood, perform their gender, perform their femininity, as if young Pakistani Muslim girls um, in, in, in England or, ev or anywhere um, somehow can perform their way out of forced marriage or, 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 or being forced to, to, to wear a full face veil. Uh, you know, as though girls out in a, a night out um, in the UK where they drink a lot of alcohol can perform their way out of being blamed if they get raped. Um, 
it, it, it's ludicrous. But it's great that, that young people are saying, look, these binaries, you know, we, we don't want to subscribe to one or the other. What they're saying, in, in, in a way, is that they're saying they they don't believe that that that, that is their destiny. They don't believe that they have to sign up to this extremity. But it's being railroaded into something that essentializes gender, despite the fact that it's supposed to be fluid, it makes it something that is in the brain. So the lost opportunity has been that we had a feminist project, which we still have, that says, we have to talk about gender because gender is the femininity and the masculinity. The sex bit is our material reality, our biological reality, our chromosomes. And why gender is so important to speak about in a political way is because we have to recognise it's been imposed upon us. And it doesn't have to be in our lives. We can get rid of it. Hmm. The blue fringe mob are wanting to further entrench gender in an essentialist way. And yet they say we're essentialists for saying we believe that we need to maintain our sex-based rights and that actually sex is relevant because for women, we are stuck in our female form under patriarchy. And it won't matter when patriarchy dies. It won't matter what genitals we have and chromosomes we have. But under patriarchy, it matters. And you can only recognise and fight against sexism when you recognise sex. Hmm. Could you give us a brief etymology of blue fringe mob? I've never heard that before. <laughs> okay, forgive me. I always imagine it travels across the ocean. <laughs> some does, some doesn't. I know, I know. Um, you know, the kind of, Today I identify as a unicorn. Um, I'm going to wear loads of nose studs and think I'm really edgy and cool and that I've subverted everything just by identifying as polyamorous, okay. identifying okay. as sapiosexual. So so those, those very privileged young people that do not recognise that material change um, has been made by feminists who fight for sex-based rights that only recognise their own narcissistic individual identities. We call them the blue fringe mob, or at least I do. Okay, okay. So with taking into account the political or the policy advances and gains uh, initiated and uh, won by your uh, wave or your faction of feminism or what you call true feminism. There's also the need, or if you want to modify patriarchy so it's not controlling uh, of females, but rather more of a girdle on male behavior, which I think is a positive form of patriarchy, uh, something that causes men to... Uh, strive for honor, for honesty, for truthfulness, you know, and, and it's just got like a male flavor, but it's just basic virtues with the male flavor. And also it comes packaged with the responsibilities inherent in being a father. And you kind of need to be taught to be a father because it's not located, fatherhood's not located in my body. It's located in the effect that my body had on, uh, on a female body. So it needs to be inculcated in men. So that brings up the question of a positive cultural influence. And I'm wondering... What have you seen with regards to male attitudes and male culture that that has been good and and in in your from your perspective has advanced and, and made things better for women? And how do we continue down that road? I think that the recognition from many men that sexual violence towards women is not something that they are programmed to commit that they are born boys with a clean slate just as we're born girls with a clean slate that there is nothing natural or inherent that would drive them to abuse women in prostitution because they have to get their rocks off to beat 
their girlfriends around because they should obey them, they should control them. There's nothing inherent um, that would make them decide that because they fancy sex and somebody else doesn't, that they can rape and that that's perfectly fine. I think men have recognised that, that men are better than that, that men are human, men are not biological, um, men are not walking dildos, men have feelings, hmm. men want to express those feelings, but it's been a risk for them to express feelings because they're a bigger, stronger, nastier men that will knock them into shape, that they also are affected adversely by the mass consumption, the constant consumption of uh, misogynistic pornography, that it has a really toxic effect on their sexual responses, um, and that actually they can have a true partnership with women and their children if they live in heterosexual relationships, and that if they're gay men, that they don't actually have to have a relationship based on sexual exploitation and who's top and who's bottom, that they can be good parents. Um, but I see more men coming to feminism, coming to be, be feminist allies, as opposed to those pseudo feminists, like some men on the left here, who will tell women what feminism is, will tell women what to do, will dictate to women that sex work is work, it's empowering. Trans women are women, how dare you dictate what a woman is? That those men have been exposed as the misogynist creeps they are, and that the feminist allies are men who are being appreciated and listened to by their peers. That being a feminist ally is a grown up and responsible thing to do, and it doesn't mean you can't have a laugh. It doesn't mean that you can't have fun in life or have loads of sex or or even have loads of sex and fun with women. It's actually about recognising that everybody's fucking miserable under patriarchy, but that men have the advantage and that men can choose to give up that advantage, but to get a whole new kind of raft um, of benefit from it. Hmm. So what's your focus on lately or presently? Is domestic and sexual violence still front and center? Or, and if it is, what, what are you doing with regards to that? And what other projects are you in, involved in right now? Well, you know, my passion is exposing the global sex trade for the, um, the, abuse, the abusive trade it is. About how, you know, if, if, we, if we had a truly equal society, prostitution mm -hmm. would be starved of oxygen, the sex trade wouldn't exist any longer, women wouldn't be up for, um, you know, de to be dehumanized, seen as orifices for men's one-sided sexual pleasure, that it gives us, it gives, it tells a story to boys growing up, if you can buy or rent an organ from a woman for 10 minutes, um, this means we don't live in an equal world with women. So that's always been my big thing, and I've just released an audio book of my 2017 um, book, The Pimping of Prostitution. Um, so that's great. That's out on Audible. And I've just finished a book entitled Feminism for Women, because at the moment I think we have a feminism that benefits men. <laughs> and the subtitle is The Real Route to Liberation. And it's a book about my my view of what feminism is, who it should benefit, what it should do, what it, should, what it means, and a kind of a bit of a... Um, a rally cry for, for young women to to just stop listening to the you know the men who head up their LGBTQQI2 spirit plus societies who dictate to them what feminism is and to say come on we'll support you we're in solidarity with you um, don't be scared to come along and admit that you think pornography is really having a bad effect on your relationships don't be scared to come along and say you don't believe trans women are women but you stand in solidarity with all oppressed minorities, say that you believe feminism should and can be a movement that centers women and girls as opposed to every other fucking group on the planet. You know, so it's a bit of a rally cry for, for young women to, to dare to, 
to adopt a feminism that is going to benefit them. What are your thoughts about this crop of young women and young people? Do you, do you have hope? What, what's your what's your fear and your hope for them? <laughs> uh, I think the fear is that young women, like we all are, and I include myself in this, although I've kind of got over it by now, so desperate to be liked, so desperate to be approved of, seek male approval because it's very dangerous not to. And often, you know, we're told that men should be at the centre of our universe, whether we give birth to them or whether we're, uh, we, we live with them as, as, as partners. And, and so my fear is that women uh, see the punishment that women like me get for speaking about male violence, for speaking about male power, for refusing to be cowed by the trans women and women orthodoxy. And it's scary because it is scary. Um, so that's my fear. But my hope and my really kind of positive approach to this and positive outlook is that more and more young women are saying we are sick of this bullshit and are seeking each other out, even if it's in kind of anonymized groups online or in real life. Um, and they're gathering strength and confidence and they are coming to feminism. And the common cause is to end male violence because these women are going through hell right now. You know, it's not just the kind of sexual violence that we grew up with or that we feared and had to avoid. It's now all the, the kind of instant access, hardcore pornography stuff that is being used to punish them um, and is being used to scare them into submission. But, but these women are tough and they will find their way and they just need support and they need us older feminists who are in the public eye especially to say, we have got your backs and we will take the bullet for you because we all needed those women. When I was a young feminist, I met those women that did that for me and that's why I'm still in the movement. Passing on the and torch. We need male allies. We need men to do their bit. And we welcome men as male allies, as feminist allies. And we appreciate that. But we will not give them a seat at the head of the table like some of them are demanding. They call themselves feminists. No. No, that's not their role. You know, they take over. And that's what the young women in universities have been telling me. They have men at the head of feminist societies, but these men are labeling themselves non-binary. What a way to absolve yourself of the privilege of patriarchy by saying I'm non-binary. Call me they, them. What's, uh, what's something in your life that's not feminism? Uh, like a hobby or what what brings you joy? Oh, Netflix, crime novels. <laughs> crime novels. Crime, novels crime yeah, because, you know, the baddie's usually caught at the end and also I can get out. Of, sometimes, you know, it's just a really good way to get out of my mind. The real horror that women are facing is to read a fictional account of it where somebody's called to task. Restaurants. I love restaurants. It's been hell during lockdown. But and I love traveling for work and learning more about different countries, different regions of the world, different cultures. I like opera. I always had a real kind of reverse snobbery about it, thinking it was only for very, you know, um, upper class people. And I've discovered it and it's great. And how, I, how did you suddenly, what was, what was the switch that flipped that prejudice? Uh, a, friend, a friend who, she's also from a working class background, told me I was wrong about opera. And if I really listened and if I came along to an opera and saw it, she said on stage, it's just like a soap opera. It's goodies and baddies and a great story and brilliant music and fun. The plots are ridiculous and it's very camp. And so she got me into it a long, long time ago. And I love, I love that. And uh, I love comedy, usually not the live stuff. And um, I love having friends around for dinner and laughing. And, and laughing at the ridiculousness of some of today's culture war. It just, it cracks me up and it really releases some stress. And I love a good Negroni and good wine. Wow. Wow. Perfect. Are you 
Do, do you have like a, a travel log foodie novel that you're going to put together, like the, the meals of Julie Bindle? Like the do you know what I would love to do? I would love to do a kind of a podcast or, yeah, maybe a podcast about countries that I visited that are where terrible, awful things are going on, where I've gone to that country to investigate the worst depravity the most horrendous things happening to women and girls and talk about that so briefly to give a context and then describe the meal in the restaurant that I found that nobody else knows about. Hmm. Describe those dishes. Describe how it took me out of the horror of what had happened that day. And the great people that you can dine out with in those places. They're never really fancy places. They don't have waiters with stiff shirts and black jackets. They're the out-of-the-way places where you have the best food that you'd never imagine that you would be sitting there eating. That's what I'd love to do. You know, the, the antidote, I, more and more I think, that the antidote to the supposed culture war is actually good culture. I think so too, and and I really appreciate the format that we concentrate on the issue, but then we remember that we're human beings. Right, right. I absolutely agree, and I think good culture. I think good manners. I think being civil with each other. I don't like the word kindness because it's now got an edge to it because it's all this be kind stuff that women are being told about the worst, the, how we should react to the worst misogynists, and I do think that we as human beings should dig deep if that's what we need to do and think about how we are connected and how we can utilize that connection to to further discussion to further debate and to think about ways in which what makes us human that's what i'm interested in and i love meeting people that i would agree with on maybe one percent of anything politically but to find that we have something, com a common core, something just there right at the center that, that connects us and that makes us look at each other differently. Is there something that we can plug? I will put links to your various works down in the description, but you have your new audio book that you delayed for, what, five, four, four years you delayed the audio book? The audio book, I can send you the link. Um, it it came out in 2017 and now was the right time to bring it out because I really wanted to just, it's done very well. It's sold very well, the, the actual book, the printed book. But I just decided I wanted it to go in as many college libraries and in as many car stereos as possible so that people might just dip into it and think about the ideas as we hear more and more bullshit under COVID about how terrible it is for these men who can't go to brothels and how terrible it is that these sex workers, and I think that's a terrible term for prostituted women, this is not work, uh, how they are not able to earn money. What you do in any civilized society is you find ways to put food in people's mouths, not to let richer, more powerful individuals, in this case men, abuse them in order to put food in that woman's mouth so that's why the audiobook's out now i wanted to give it another burst and then my forthcoming book which i'll send you the link for in the catalog what's the title of the forthcoming book feminism for women the real route to liberation Sounds coming out like a great resource in september september 2nd are you going to delay the audiobook by four or five years? Are you going to? Is that, no, are going that'll to come out. That'll come out alongside it. Oh wow! There we go. <laughs> well, thank you so much for your time, Julie. It's been uh, I've been following you and watching you and learning so much from you over the past couple of years when I stumbled into this section of the conversation. So it's great to meet you. Uh, you too, Benjamin, and thank you for your work, and thank you very much for having me on your show. Congratulations for reaching the end of the discussion. If you enjoyed it, do be sure to leave a review or a comment or a thumbs up or whatever you need to do 
to show that glorious algorithm that this is some good stuff. And do be sure to go and check that back catalog as it is brimming full of fantastic conversations. Links to provide monetary support are down there in the description as well. Have a good night.